to share with you what the Lord's put on my heart uh, in relation to this. It's a message that we're all familiar with. I believe after a word of prayer, I'll read that for you. If we would, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Al's addressed it, but again, I'd like to uh, say, let's take a moment and confess any sin. Confession of sin is necessary so that God, the Holy Spirit, can teach us his word. And it is his word that's what changes our lives. It was his word that proclaimed that Christ would come into the world. It was his word that said that he would die on a cross and be buried for our sins and then be risen again. And so it is with that in mind, let's just take a moment. Well, Father, I do thank you for this opportunity to come before you as an ambassador to the throne, Father. I just pray that you will give me the words that you want me to speak clearly. Give me the words to those who are out there listening by internet and in this classroom setting that uh, there'd be clarity, be simplicity. Uh, I pray for that, Father. I pray that now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you'll turn to your Bible there in Luke, this is the part of the story uh, pertaining to the birth of Christ. This is after he's been born, Joseph and Mary. She's given birth, wrapped her son in the cloth, and now we're going to pick up where it says, verse 8. And in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terribly frightened. And they said, and the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men, with whom he is pleased. And it came about when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds began to say one another to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste, and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. Well, <clears throat> Today's lesson for me, I don't have it on your paper, but I've got it here, is really cycling by faith the Word of God as it's related to the birth of Christ. And to me, that's what's important here. I'll give you a little background as to why. Um, Christmas, I'm more nervous now talking to y'all about certain things. Christmas for me was not really a, a big deal. It was uh, not a real pleasant pleasant memory and so it has the majority of my life has been focused on um, basically the death burial resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ than it has been on his birth and so um, it has taken me to cycle the word of God by faith as it relates to the birth of Christ for me to get a clear understanding. Now, naturally, if he wasn't born, we wouldn't have the other parts of it. But my point is, is that I didn't focus much on that because when we invite people to come to church, um, at Christmas time, 
the pastors, the people would come out and invite you to come to church and come on in, come on in, and everybody's all happy. Well, I would have to kind of go back because I wasn't really, I wasn't, I, I, for better words, I wasn't really allowed to go. So, <laughs> uh, so it was, it was, it was hard for me to feel the joy because it's if you base your joy only on what you're going to get for Christmas time, um, you'll you you're going to be an unhappy person. And so that's why I'm trying to say is the joy for me, the gift of a great joy has has to do with the fact that um, we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. So when when I heard this passage of scripture, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and it goes like this, for by grace, I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. For by grace, you are saved. It, for by grace, you are saved. It's not of works. I can't do it. It is a gift of God. And so when that finally settled in, and I cycled that word by faith, when I began to understand what does this mean, that God has given me salvation. God has given me eternal life. God has given me a gift. This gift is of importance. Cycling it by faith as I grow in the Word of God, I can now say, as my title says, a gift of a great joy. Uh, kind of was interesting, we were discussing that, going back and forth in this passage in verse 10, it says, and the angel said, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of a great joy. Well, it depends on your Bible. Some, some Bibles don't have of a great joy. And so, uh, my Bible did so, I wrote it down in my title, I like that. It's a gift. God has given me salvation. God has given me eternal life. Now I can have joy. I don't have to base it on what everybody else is doing. I base it on what the Word of God says to me personally. That's what salvation is. How am I affected personally? Well, anyway, that's my personal testimony. So let's go ahead and we'll take a look at this. Let's look at our Christmas study of faith. And I want to use this homiletical outline to guide me. I've got shepherds, signs, Savior. Now then, I brought up Ephesians 2, 8, 9 because for by grace you're saved through faith. Here's the key. There really are only two systems of faith in the world. One's promoted by the devil. We'll call that cosmos diabolicus. The other system of faith is the divine viewpoint of, of God. Look at Matthew 16, if you would, for a moment. I want... Take a look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13. I want to show you what the difference is. I'm sure you're familiar, but in, in case you are not familiar with this, when you hear people say divine viewpoint or uh, worldly viewpoint, let's take a look at, there's a, here's an illustration that, that the Word of God points out about um, what this is. If you look at chapter 16, verses uh, 13 through 17, this is where Jesus is talking with Peter and them, and he says to them, who do people say that I am? They say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Divine viewpoint, divine viewpoint. Who are you, Christ? Christ, you are the son of the living God. You are the one who was to come. We don't get that from the world. Now then, worldly viewpoint. Take a look, drop down there to, to, to uh, verse 21 in the same chapter. Y'all are familiar with the story, but here's the point. You've got divine viewpoint. You've got worldly viewpoint. Now then, from this time on, Jesus, notice, began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised up on the third day. Jesus told them, this is what's going to happen to me. What does the world go, how does the world go about doing things? When, when we hear the word of God, <clears throat> who moves in to try to get us to not listen? 
cosmos diabolicus. The devil moves in, tries to get you not to hear the truth of the Word of God. Why is that important? The Word of God is what's going to change your life. All right. So Peter says to Jesus, he took him aside, and he told him, Stop saying that. God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Never. Now, we know Peter. He's pretty passionate. He said, I will never, I will never desert you. I will never. Hmm. Anyway, Jesus turns and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. We call that cosmos diabolicus, human viewpoint. That, that's when we're born into this world. We are raised on this human viewpoint until we reach a point when we become saved. We still got that human viewpoint, but we have to trust what God's Word says. You, you, you have to put off that old man. See, Put on that new man that's only going to come from the Word of God. Okay. This is important, knowing the differences for two reasons. You, you, will be, you will build your faith from either of these two systems. Faith in Christ, faith in the world. You will become allied with the source of that faith system you choose. Satan's worldly viewpoint or, get, or God's divine viewpoint. All right, for example, I've got it on your paper there. But it comes from Matthew 6, 19, 20, 21. And this is an illustration of what I'm trying to say. We live in, a, right now, the most prosperous nation in the world, right? So, to us, um, human viewpoint is, is that the more that I gain, the more that I get, the more that I have, the more that I set aside, the more that security that I build, I'm going to be okay, human viewpoint. Listen to what the Lord says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. I tell you this because I took this personal, okay? So I live day by day. Whatever the Lord sends my way, that's how I live. Some people think it's dumb. Sometimes I do. But, 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 here's what I stand on. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. Here's the key. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Why do I say that? Well, I'm going to turn over to it. Back at Luke, I've got, do I have it on your paper, Luke 2, 19, 51? All right. I want you to look at that. What I'm trying to tell you in this case is, is it's, this is a form of spiritual growth maturity. What does that mean? Simply this is watch what we have here. If that passage of Scripture is tough for you from, from Matthew 6, 19, it's okay. It's okay. Look. Look at verse 219. He says, your, Jesus says, your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus' mama has carried him. Now, you know, she was told in, in chapter 1 that she was going to have this child. She was told that this child is going to be save his people from their sins. She was told that this child, he will be great, we will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God. Now, she's carried this child for nine months. She's delivered this child, okay? Now, then, I give her credit, because if you look at verse 19, it says, but Mary, this is after the shepherds have come done, and they've said, hey, we were out in the fields at work, and this angel came up and told us all about this going on, and, 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 and we just had to see this, and we came down here. Now, she's delivered a child. She's probably tired. Okay? No telling what else. I haven't delivered one, but I've, 
was with my wife when she delivered too. <laughs> so what am I saying is now she's had to entertain company. But they've told her something, and what does she say? But, but Mary treasured up all these things, what they said, pondering them in her heart. Now, she's like, what's going on? I'm not. For me, that's hard because here I am 2,000 years later, and I can read a book, and I can go, hey, well, you know, what's the problem? But reality is, is how did she feel that day? Watch. Turn over. In the same chapter, she's pondering this idea who, of how special this child is. Now then, about 12 years later, this is when Jesus got misplaced. They couldn't find him, and they had to look several days, and then they finally found him. They found him in the temple. And he says this. She says, his mother says to him in verse 48, why, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. He said to them, why is it you were looking for me? Did you not know I'm, that I had to be in my father's house? He, he, you realize, don't you, that when you put your trust in Christ, he is your father. He's our father. That's who he is. He's our father. My earthly father told me I couldn't go to church. My heavenly father said, hey, you're always welcome. They did not understand the statement. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So now we've gone from pondering to now, about 12 years later, she's beginning to treasure. Now then, I'll read it to you. But if you, took, if you look at John, I say this is called spiritual growth momentum or spiritual growth because when you look at John chapter 2, she's grown from pondering and wondering about what's going on to she's cycled the word of God of faith to where now then she's treasuring at 12 years old the word of God in her heart. Now then, in chapter 2, verse 3 of, of um, or, calm down, Ernie. John 2, <laughs> uh, here we've grown, my point is we've grown to this point now. They're, they're, she says to Jesus, uh, they've given out of wine. They have no wine. And Jesus says to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. And here's my point. If you don't get anything out of my lesson today, listen to this. Do what Jesus says. She says to him, look at how she's grown. I've wandered over the word of God when I first hear it, but I've cycled it. I grew to where now I begin to treasure it. Now then, his mother says to the servant, whatever he says to you, do it. Do it. We, we sit up here and we teach all the time. Well, excuse me. We don't, but we have good teachers, and they tell us God's Word, you know, and it takes a while. When we have our Greek class, our Hebrew class, it takes a while. You know, uh, you come in, and you listen, and you're like, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, we tell them, just keep coming, and you'll get it. Just keep coming, you'll get the Word of God. When you do... Do it. Why do I say this? She's treasured it, treasured it, treasured it in her heart. Do you treasure God's word in your heart? Yes, you do. Why? Because the human heart has the free will to choose whatever system we're looking for. You know, if I'm wanting to look for the world to find relief, I think I found a relief, but I'm always disappointed. Always. Always. Look to the Word of God. Never disappointed. So even a slow guy like me can figure out in a little while, well, maybe a long while, which way to go. The divine, the divine faith system is based on the truth of the Word of God. 1 Timothy 2.4 and Ephesians 6.14. The point is, the Word of God is always the working object of divine faith. So, 
back to our outline. I just wanted to lay the groundwork on. It's all about faith. It's all about faith. Faith in the truth of the Word of God and cycling the Word of God by faith. So let's use this story as a, as a way of doing that. Why did God choose shepherds to reveal the good news of great joy? I'm going to read it to you, but if you look on your paper, you're going to see a, a, a verse there, and if you want to turn to it, you're welcome to it. But here's, here's the point. They were faithful, okay? They were faithful. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, and this is why it's important to me, why did God choose these shepherds? Well, listen to what Paul writes. He says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, See, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not that he, that he might nullify the things that are so that no man should boast before God. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The idea is it's all about God, what he's done. What do you believe is what he's asking you. In whom do you believe? So why did he choose these shepherds? Well, let's take a look at them for a moment. You've got a pivot of believers here I've listed, uh, and that's the key. They were believers in the word of God and they were looking for the Messiah they were looking according to God's word they were looking for these people all of them have a, a unique title except for the shepherds Mary and Joseph they were considered righteous and you'll see the passages there Zacharias and Elizabeth he was a priest they were considered right they were righteous the title is in the scriptures that says that Simon the righteous man in the temple uh, Anna, the widowed prophetess, living in the temple. All right? They all have that title righteous with them. Now then, it has, and these shepherds, and these are the only recorded pivot of believers that are still looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And that's at that end of that passage, Luke 2, 38. They're looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. God's plan of redemption for fallen man has always been the same by grace, through faith. Always been the same. Old Testament believers have always been saved the same way, by the prophetic gospel of Jesus Christ. New Testament believers are saved the same way, by the historical gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? Y'all are a great church. I'm allowed to talk to you like I'm talking to people who don't know anything. Y'all know more than I do, but that's okay. The point is, is it's what's on your heart and what's important. And here's, here's what's important is if you didn't know what the gospel is, I'm going to tell it to you. And I'm going to tell you where you can find it too. It's, you'll find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, but specifically in 3 and 4. And the gospel has always been the same and always will be the same. These shepherds relate to this story, but the gospel simply is this, is that if you believe Christ died for your sins personally, and on the third day that he was buried, and that on the third day God raised him from the dead, if that's what you believe, then you're saved. It's not hard. It's not hard, but the, the, the joy, the gifts, all the things that are connected to that, that God gives you, that's what's important. It takes time to understand and to, to know what does that really mean. When I believe that gospel message, <laughs> the Bible tells me that God translated me from darkness into light. See, Colossians 1.13. That's important. I didn't do nothing. That's what's important about that. Why, so as I speak to you, 
1 Corinthians 1.30. As Paul's continuing that lesson about whom God chose, now then he says, by God's doing, you, I've got church age believer, that's who we are. We're not the shepherds, but we are shepherds. We're shepherds in our own way, in a different way, but we are shepherds. I'll, I'll get to that. By God's doing, you, church age believer, are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, see, church age believer. They were looking for the redemption of God to come to Jerusalem. Now then, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. They're looking for it. We have it. These are just a handful of believers whose faith was in the word of God and were looking for the coming Messiah. And I ask you now as a church age believer, are we proclaiming his death until he comes? Are we looking for his return in the air? 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17. Proclaiming his death until he returns. Are we doing that? Yeah, we are. That's what we're doing. That's who we are as a pivot of believer here. I got confidence in y'all. All right. Shepherds have been used by God from the beginning to reveal his plan of grace salvation, the substitutional blood offering as an atonement for man's sin ever since the beginning. For example, Abel in Genesis 4.4 where Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock. What was the importance of that? To show the shed blood of Christ. He's demonstrating, I have faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ that you're going to provide in history. This is for the Gentiles. This is a, an example of how the Gentiles could follow the gospel of Christ. Abraham, Genesis 13, 2. This was for the Jews. This is when God's moved it from the Gentiles. Now he's called for him a Jew. Why? Because the child's going to be born through this lineage. Uh, Moses. This is where in Exodus 3.1, Moses is shepherding the flock, and then he walks up onto the mountain. He hears God, and he says he goes up on the mountain. So the law, then Moses is given the law. We know that. The law given to the, the laws given to the Jews. So then we come down to David. These are all examples of shepherds. David was a, was a shepherd, 1 Samuel 16, 11. Remember? Samuel has to anoint David. He's out in the field. He's doing his job. He's doing what he's supposed to do. That's all we really can do, go and do our job, have the opportunity to share it. Now, in Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah writes, to, uh, he speaks to the nation of Israel, to the apostate nation, actually, and he makes a declaration. God tells him to tell them. He tells the leaders in charge of his people. He calls the leaders shepherds and the people his flock. He declares he will scatter these shepherds and bring in his own shepherd. These shepherds were not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not feeding the flock. They're not, they're not teaching the truth of God's word so that the people can cycle it and grow they become apostate. They're not interested. Jesus declares in John 10, 14, that he's the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. This is the shepherd that was referred to in Jeremiah. Peter calls Jesus in 1 Peter 2, 25, the shepherd and guardian of your souls. You see why I can get happy over this? Because somebody else is in charge of my soul. Now it's up to me to listen to what he tells me in order to keep my rear end out of trouble. But, uh, 1 Peter 5, 4, again, Peter says, Christ, the chief shepherd. So shepherds are, have been and always will be important to the plan of God. But as we go along, these shepherds are not just any ordinary shepherds. These shepherds at the birth of Christ, these were the temple shepherds. It's, and this is their job to keep the flocks for the priest to offer as sacrifices according to Leviticus chapters 1, 3, 4, and 5. See, of the law given by God to Moses. Why is that important? Well, when I was 
my boy was little, he would ask me, what you doing, Daddy? I'm building so-and-so. So why are you building that? Well, I'm a carpenter. I do so-and-so. Well, these men's job, so when their kids say to them, what you doing? Well, I'm tending the flocks of sheep that the priests are going to offer as a sacrifice. They're going to shed the blood for the remission of our sins according to God's plan. And one day God is going to send us a Messiah to take the place of these sheep and to take the place of mankind. And so these shepherds were also chosen because it, what did they believe? What did they believe? What, what do we believe? We believe Christ died in our place for our sins, that he was buried and risen again. That's what we believe. We walk by faith. The good news, okay, uh, excuse me. These were the burnt offerings, the peace offering, the sin, and the guilt offering. These were all laid out by God to Moses. Look what we call shadow. These, these were examples of shadow Christology leading us to the, the, the day of this birth. The good news that this angel Gabriel was delivering to these shepherds was that within 33 years, this shadow Christology offering would cease. God would establish a new covenant affecting all who believe. Jeremiah 31, 34, he says, I will for, this is the new covenant that I will make with them. I will forgive their iniquities and their sins. I will remember no more. Hebrews 10, 1. The law, since it is only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very former things, can never by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. Verse 11 and 12. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. That's also a quote from Psalms 110.1. And then Hebrews 10.14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, I tell you that. I told you earlier. Christmas comes around year I'm five years old, I'm six years old, I'm seven years old, year after year after year. Being told it's going to be happy, ha, 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 always disappointment, right? Finally, I don't have to be disappointed anymore. See, it says, year by year they offer continually the same thing, but it will never take away sin, but he the birth, the Christ, the one chosen, he will take it away for us. He can take it away. Suffering, misery, whatever, he can take it away. See, so I don't have to hang on to it anymore. It's All right, doctrinal point. The point is, these believers were chosen. God reveals his plan to them. It doesn't matter. It only takes a remnant of believers to proclaim God's grace plan of good news for the whole human race. It only takes us. We don't have to be smart. We don't have to be whatever. All we have to do is, is say it. Tell them. All right, signs. As we're, we're, as we're moving along here, signs. Signs are used by God in the Old Testament as a grace marker of deliverance before judgment. Let me give you a couple of examples. A grace marker of deliverance before judgment because he's going to judge the world. In fact, it's, Jesus has already been judged. He that believeth not has been judged already. See, I didn't come into the world, he says, to condemn the world, but that the world through me might become saved. Human viewpoint, divine viewpoint. <laughs> Jesus says, the world... The world can become saved. That's God's viewpoint, the whole world. We walk around here thinking, well, 
the world tells us there's no way. Our Lord tells us, I am the way. 1 Samuel 2.34 is where, this is a sign, that I looked up sign for, 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 from my uh, text here just a little bit, but so, this is where Samuel tells Eli that this is going to be a sign to you that, that I'm taking away your life, I'm taking away your son's lives, and I'm going to appoint my own shepherd, my own prophet. And so the sign was to, the, to Eli was that both of his boys will die on the same day along with their father. Now the father wasn't upset over the boys dying. The father was upset over the Ark of the Covenant getting gone. It, at least he, it was more important to him God's word than his own boys' lives because they were bad boys. They were bad. But it was his responsibility and he he didn't do he didn't do his job. So God raised his own prophet up. Another one is in 2 Kings 28a, 8b. And this was a sign that uh, to Hezekiah, and that was that he was going to prolong his life for 15 years, longer than you know he had con he said he was sick and he was going to die. And he says, "Oh Lord," he prays to the God and he says, "Okay, well here's." I'll prolong your life 15 years. So Hezekiah says, well, how am I going to know that's true? And he says, well, uh, I'll uh, give me a sign so that I know this is true. And, and basically the sign was is that if the shadow would go back 10 steps, like, you know, in other words, the sun's going to go back rather than keep going in the same way. This is like a, only God can do this. Okay? And here we are, our Christmas story. In seven, Isaiah 7, 11 through 14, Isaiah to King Ahaz, he tells, Isaiah tells this king to ask a sign from the Lord, and Ahaz refuses. He said, oh no, I never, therefore the, I would never ask the Lord for, for something like that. He was trying to be holy. It wasn't working. Okay, so here's, here's what Isaiah says to him. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. He will be called Emmanuel. And that's from our Christmas story, of course, Matthew 121. Uh, because, and here's my point is, God, signs were used by God. Let me back up and see how. I, the, they were grace markers of deliverance before judgment. These are markers. Because see, what happened since Ahaz refused, he goes, because of his refusal to ask God for help, the Assyrians plundered the temple and Ahaz's own treasury to pay for their assistance in war. In other words, if you had come to God and asked God to do, God will respond. Our lesson today shows us how God used signs to identify the child. Uh, Born that day, whom he revealed as Savior, Christ the Lord. An interesting note. This sign, the sign of, of the babe wrapped in, in, in uh, cloths, Jesus' ministry of miracles, his death, his death, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and also the sign of tongues. These are going to be the last signs God uses before he places this nation of Israel under the fifth cycle of divine discipline. He does that in 70 AD. Remember, why is that? Well, 1 Corinthians 1, through 24 tells us why God uses signs to the Old Testament believers. Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. But to us, to those of us who are called both Jew, to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Remember, the angel said, "He is the Savior, who is Christ, who is the Lord." See, he tells them he uses the verb, which will be. 
which is the verb aimi, which is really a verb of absolute status quo of existence. It's future middle indicative, but the point is, is that this, this Christ child, this child will be, this child will be the savior of the world. This child is the Christ whom you've been looking for. This child will be the Lord. Uh, the word of God is always the working object of divine faith. Now, I like this passage of Scripture because I like the, the faith because we're saved by grace through faith. Faith has a lot. Faith means a lot to me. And I liked it because of this is a real good example of if you ever want to teach the faith cycle to somebody and you need some, this is the faith cycle. This is a visual faith cycle, I guess is what I'm trying to say. How so? Well, just for example, the angel of the Lord gives the shepherds the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17. So they hear the word of God. All right, the angels leave. Then they go, hmm. They began to talk to themselves, and they go, we've got to go see this because of what this angel has said. So they began to believe the word of God. Hebrews 4, 2. Hebrews 4, 2 tells us that when we hear the word of God, the word of God was of none effect to the Old Testament believers because they didn't attach their faith to it. When you attach your faith to the word of God, it produces, you, you, you believe the word of God, and in this case, they believed it, and so they said, let us go. See, let's go. Boom. Where are they going to go? Well, next comes applying the faith of God. Well, we're going to go where he said to go. I hear what the word of God says. I believe what the word of God says. Now I'm going to go do what the Word of God says. I apply the Word of God to my life. My life becomes better when I do that. So they applied it. Uh, they go and see Mary. And then what's so, to me, that's exciting too is when they had seen this, they go and see Mary. And then it says they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that he had heard and seen just as had been told them. So what am I saying? God proclaimed his son would come. His son would be born. He, he said, even in his word that the son's going to grow, he's going to die on a cross for the sin of the world. He's going to be buried. He's going to be risen again. These shepherds, understood that message. They understood you can look to God's word. He's never going to let you down. He's going to always produce what he's promised he's going to do. And so in closing, what I'd like to do is uh, I guess I want to remind us uh, how happy, how joyful, how magnificent the birth of Christ really is. It's taken me to walk by faith to get to that place. Um, many people don't have that there are many people out there who were like I was. So my prayer for us this Christmas is to open your eyes and, and look around and see. Let, listen to the Holy Spirit and let him direct you to someone who you can share the joy of Jesus Christ to. I hear it all the time on the TV and the guys, but the bottom line is, do that. Um, 
I know Al was uh, referring to in um, the Facebook, but it is the Word of God. It is the Word of God that's important. It's the Word of God. It is Christ dying for our sins, being buried, risen again. That's the important thing. Uh, the world doesn't want to hear us talk about that. Don't listen to the world. Listen to the word. Uh, what I was getting at was is kind of our numbers are shrinking. So maybe if we just go out there and ask somebody to come to church. It's not that hard. Just ask them. We don't have to have special tools. We have a mouth. Just ask people. Um, somebody asked me to come, and and I'm and that somebody asked me to come, and uh, it was not to church in the sense of they asked me to come talk to a man, and he explained to me the gospel, and that's all it took. Like then, God couldn't get rid of me. It was like <laughs> he can't get rid of me now. <laughs> 